a lot of companies out there and, uh, and talking to a lot of VCs. And uh, we, we found that, that there's not really a consistency around you know, what is this SaaS business model and, and, and how do I use uh, the power of this, this business model to, to, to advance my own business. So, uh, you know, we all know here that, uh, you know, on-premise is dead. Uh, Gartner saying this, IDC saying this, and SaaS is becoming the dominant software model today. And uh, when, when you think about SaaS, the heart of SaaS is the subscription model. And, and this whole concept uh, of, of saying that, that, that you can subscribe to something and not buy products is happening all around us. It's not just in the software industry, but for example, you know, we as people and consumers, we're not buying CDs, we're not buying cars, or we have the option not to buy a car if we have a second car and uh, we go to school at Stanford, uh, we, can, we can use Zipcar, or we, we don't buy DVDs anymore, we can subscribe to, to services through, through Netflix or even through streaming services offered by, by Comcast. And, and this is happening across every industry where today we have choices. We don't have to buy, we can just subscribe. So four years ago, we coined this term, uh, the subscription economy. And uh, if, you, if you look back 10 to 12 years ago, uh, it was all about buying products. That's what, what we did. We uh, were, were part of the dot-com era where we would buy products, physical goods, and, and have them shipped to us uh, through, 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 through mail delivery or go to a brick and mortar store and bring them back. Uh, but today, you can subscribe to, to whatever service uh, that, that, that you need. And, and when you subscribe to service, it's a, a different way of thinking about your business model. In the traditional product model, it was about being focused on how many products do you ship, how many units do you ship, uh, how do you get that product from point A to point B to point C, uh, but in the subscription economy, it's all about acquiring customers and then servicing those customers and then building a relationship with those customers over time. Now, when you look at, at the, the business model, it's really different. Uh, first, uh, pricing in the subscription economy uh, is different. Uh, it's about plan-based. It's about one-time fees, recurring fees, and usage fees all bundled together. It's the, about the ability to offer free trials uh, or a freemium model or pay-as-you-go to bring customers uh, to, to the forefront and, and get them to, to use your services right away. Commerce is also different. Uh, it's, it's, it's about multiple types of orders. Uh, think about uh, the initial order and the add-on order and a change order and upgrades and cancellations. Uh, there, there's a whole array of different orders uh, that uh, as a business you're, you're forced to deal with. And then lastly, finance is different. Uh, when, when you think about the way traditional income statements were built and, and traditional finance for product-based businesses, uh, it was about looking backwards. It was about looking at how much money did we make in the last period. But in the subscription economy, uh, you want to know what's happening in the next period, in the period after that, and, 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 and you know, the lifetime of, of, of that customer and, and all the customers that, that you're acquiring. So here is the, the fundamental business model for, for the subscription economy. And you'll, you'll be hearing Evangelos talk about some of uh, the, the more um, uh, nuanced metrics such as MRR, uh, customer lifetime value, and churn. Uh, but, but for this model, um, we start with ARR, which is just monthly recurring revenue times 12. Uh, and uh, when, when you look at this, this ARR, uh, the first thing you have to look at is you have to spend some money to service the base. So that's your COGS, that's your GNA, um, and then then you're going to lose some customers, right? It's it's it's, it's inevitable that you know you're going to churn five percent or ten percent. Hopefully, it's not more than than ten percent of your customers on, on an annual basis. Uh, but you're just going to going to churn some customers, and then you're going to add some customers, or you're going to upsell customers, and that's new ACV that you're bringing on into to 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 the year. So you end up with with an ending ARR, and this is the fundamental business model of the subscription economy, really, really just simplified and boiled down. Now, we would argue, as I just stated, that the income statement for the subscription economy starts with ARR. So let's just go through a simple example. You start the year with $100, 
but you know you're going to, to lose a little bit of customers. So let's say that, that you have a 90% uh, renewal rate. So you lose 10% 10 10 of your customers. That's not bad. Uh, so you start uh, the period with, with, with 90, uh, but then you have to service the base. Uh, so uh, you, you know, these are our recurring expenses. So uh, you have some COGS, you have some GNA, you have some, some R&D. So you spend maybe $50 to, to, to service the base. Uh, so you end uh, with, uh, with $40 of, of recurring profit. Now that's pretty good business. Uh, it only costs me $60 because I'm adding the $50 to service the base plus churn to, to, to service, um, to, to grow my, my, my business, and, uh, and I acquire $40 with this model. But you ask yourself here, you know, what happened to sales and marketing? Well, to simplify uh, this model for, for our argument, we call sales and marketing uh, one-time costs. As, as if you think about sales and marketing, these are one-time costs uh, that, that you, you use to grow the base. Like, this month you may spend more marketing dollars to try to drive new customers or you may have more sales reps that you acquire in the first half of the year than the, in the last half of the year in order to, to grow the base. Uh, and and, and when, you, when you look at this model, it's all based on, on how do you grow ARR. So with this model, you have really two choices. Uh, you can be a business where you have full market potential and you're just going to spend a little bit of money on base. And, uh, and that's called optimizing for margin. And uh, you, know, you, you, you basically spend a little money and uh, you, you end the year at, at, at $100. Uh, but let's say that your market is exploding, uh, you're in a land grab situation, and you wanna spend everything on growth. So in this scenario, you're gonna pour in um, all the money back into to growth, and you're gonna come out uh, with 130 uh, next year as I have $40 in, in, in recurring profit margins still uh, even though um, I invest in, in, in growth here. So this is kind of what every SaaS company and every subscription company wakes up and think, thinks about it is, is do I believe in growth? If so, then do I invest all of it or a portion of it into growth because I know that this is going to drive an ending ARR number. So if you take this business model um, from a top level perspective, it really boils down into to three key metrics uh, that, that we think are, are really, really important for, for any type of SaaS or subscription business to, to be able to, to absorb. It's, it's your retention rate. Uh, how much business do you retain on a month over month or annual basis? What is my recurring profit margin? So after you spend money, how much money do you have left to, 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 to invest in, in, in growth. And then your growth efficiency index, which is uh, for every dollar I invest in growth, what do I get back? Do I get back a dollar? Do I get back $30? Do I get back $40? And, and, and we think that um, these are the three metrics uh, that, that, that you need to run a subscription business today. And this is just uh, another explanation of that. So let's, uh, let's take a look at the, these metrics for, for a few SaaS companies that, that we all know about. Now we had to do a little bit of reverse engineering um, and, and some guesswork to, to get these, to these numbers. Um, but but what, we, what we did was we did a comparison of, of Salesforce, of NetSuite, uh, of success factors. And uh, we, we did each of them through a period of time um, in, in the early days when they were, were growing um, uh, pre-IPO. And uh, it, it basically it reached, uh, when they were about reaching $100 million is, is when we, we benchmarked these companies. So, so, so let's look at, at, at Salesforce.com, for example. Um, from 2001 to 2004, I think Salesforce grew from like $37 million to, to about $231 million. Uh, so so, so they, they, they grew pretty fast. Uh, you know, NetSuite, from 2004 to 2007, they grew from, from like 22 mil to, to 105. And then success factors grew from 40 to, to 147 between 2006 and, and 2009. Um, so so when, when you look at, at these different metrics across these different companies, it's really, really interesting. Uh, you can see here that Salesforce.com had a, uh, a growth efficiency index of 75. 
NetSuite was 1.26, and success, success factors was, was, was 2.15. Uh, you know, success factors grew um, ARR um, fast during this time period, uh, but they, they weren't really capital efficient. They were spending a lot of money, we assume, on, on, on COGS, on, on their infrastructure, on, on, on people. Um, but the renewals, on the other hand, was pretty good. So SaskFactors had a 92% renewals rate, and uh, this was, was greater than NetSuite and Salesforce. And uh, if you think about success factors, you know, in, in the early days, their products primarily were, were aimed at the enterprise. So with, with enterprise businesses, you have less, less churn. So, so, so these numbers, numbers made, made a lot of sense. But what you find, find really, really interesting here is, is Salesforce.com um, has really, really high profit margins. So what did this mean? This means that, that with a, a recurring profit margin, you know, net it down to 58%, they have a lot of money to, to, to reinvest in growth. And uh, even today, at, as a $2 billion entity, you know, they're still growing at, at 30, 30 to 35% per year. And um, you know, they're investing a lot of money into continued growth. Uh, so, so, so this is kind of what we've seen as, as kind of you know, comparing these three companies during their growth years to $100 million, kind of where each of the, these companies fit. And what we're trying to prescribe as, as the best practice model here internally is that you know, uh, as we, we build our company here at Zora, as we talk to other SaaS businesses out there, we think a one-to-one -one growth efficiency ratio is, is really effective. So every dollar uh, you spend should yield a dollar of ACV. Uh, we also um, strive to, to, to achieve a 90% renewals rate. So, so how do you, you, you service your, your renewals base and, and what do you do to, to drive customer success? And then for recurring profit margin, uh, we try to maintain a 50% a rate. We think that is, is, is pretty good in, in, in an industry standard. Uh, so, you know, those are our three SaaS metrics that, that, that we've really been, been, been talking about recently. Uh, we're getting a lot of great feedback for, from companies out there uh, that, that are interested in, in, in trying to figure out how to model this for, for their business. Uh, but I wanted to, to bring now Evangelo here to tell you about, you know, some other metrics and also to uh, give you a perspective of, of really what is required uh, to, to build a breakout company. And there, there's nobody better to, to, to say this than somebody who is seeing day in and day out hundreds of companies, both from a, a, a pre kind of uh, portfolio all the way through you know, managing uh, companies in, in the Trident portfolio. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to, to Evangelos to, uh, to take it from here. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, while there's a lot of talk about SaaS companies, I wanted to spend the next few minutes uh, talking about the metrics and the characteristics that we believe define breakout SaaS companies. Um, we hear and read a lot about the accelerating adoption of SaaS applications, and, and today we're on the third wave, we believe we're in the third wave of SaaS applications. We have moved uh, all previous applications to the cloud, that was the, the first wave. Uh, we use the cloud to create uh, SaaS applications uh, with uh, unique functionality that benefit, we believe, intra-enterprise operations, and that was the, the second wave. And we're now uh, moving to, to data-driven SaaS applications where social and mobile play a key role while benefiting the inter-enterprise operations. And in each of these phases, uh, we have seen the, the emergence of, uh, of leaders and breakout companies. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as uh, at, at Trident, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we have invested in, uh, in SaaS companies in every wave and have learned to focus uh, both on, on breakout companies when we invest in, in late stage, so in other words, just focus only on the breakout companies in our late stage investments, but also uh, where we spend a lot of time is trying to identify the next generation of breakout companies. And the reason that we do that is because we have determined over the years that breakout SaaS companies generate high returns, and we see that both uh, on the public side, and Jeff already mentioned uh, some of the characteristics of uh, uh, these publicly uh, traded companies right now and the, and the returns and the multiples that, uh, that they get, as well as we see and read about that 
uh, about uh, private companies and the valuations that they achieve. Now, when we consider SaaS companies in order to determine if they have breakout potential, at a very high level, we look at the uh, uh, sustainable high year-over-year -year annual recurring revenue growth rate. We want that to be greater than the markets, in a, and we want to, that to be achieved in a capital-efficient way. Uh, we're looking for sustainable and leveraged sales and support models as they are reflected uh, by the sales and support costs. And we're looking for these companies to have both strong management teams and a leadership position in their corresponding markets. And to us, leadership means typically to be in the, in the top three, particularly in the more mature companies. So let's go to the next slide. Um, to, to better understand the importance of annual recurring revenue, and of capital efficiency, I think it is important to understand the, the SaaS customer life cycle and realize first where the opportunities for revenues exist, second, uh, how costs and expenses contribute to these revenues, and finally, the, the role of customer lifetime value in determining how to work with customers and, and prospects. So, um, I've, been, I've been working on this for, for some time, and, and what I, I have come to, if there is one thing to, to take out from, from uh, this slide, is that you need to start calculating customer lifetime value early on. And initially, uh, in your, when you're getting your, your leads in, you need to just make a, a, an initial uh, estimation of what the, the CLV, the customer lifetime value, will be, because that will dictate both your sales approach and how to prioritize those, those leads. Later on, as you're coming to the point of, of renewing your customers or upselling to your customers, you have the opportunity to, work, to do a more refined uh, CLV calculation, which will dictate, again, your sales approach and how to prioritize uh, your customers. So we'll talk a little bit uh, as, as we move forward. So let's go to the next slide. Um, now, just because you are aware of the life cycle doesn't, ma doesn't make you a breakout company. Um, uh, we have observed that breakout SaaS companies uh, or companies that have the best potential to become uh, breakout successes, first focus on the right prospects and customers and know how to make customers right. In other words, they know how to make their customers profitable. Um, the second thing is that they focus on the right revenue type and on contract length and payments terms. That means that uh, they, they focus on the license revenue a lot more on uh, any other type of revenue, including services revenue. Next, they focus on the right cost and on their impact on, on uh, annual recurring revenue. A lot of times we have companies that, that come to pitch to us and they talk only about acquisition costs, but there really there are a lot of other costs as you saw in that uh, life cycle depiction. There's a servicing and retention cost, there's a new and upgrade cost which also have to be taken into account. The next thing you need to understand the impact of the annual recurring revenue churn as opposed to the customer count churn and its effect on the business model. Again, we, we often have companies talking to us about uh, a very low customer count churn uh, while they ignore what is, that, what is the impact of that churn to their, um, to their ARR. And sometimes either they worry uh, without reason or other times they don't worry enough. Next day, mm -hmm. these companies identify other necessary operating expenses and their impact on profit margins and on the ARR and they determine the necessary investment to reach profitability under the particular business model that's being used. Uh, I know that in these days, particularly in Silicon Valley, where uh, money appears to be uh, flowing quite easily, it is important for the entrepreneur, for the management team, to, to be much more introspective of what it will take to reach profitability. And finally, these companies, I mean, the, the ones that both have breakout potential or already breakout companies through finding that they understand when to go for market share and when to go for profitability. And then again, that's an important lever because it impacts the amount of money that you need to raise and obviously it impacts all the other uh, metrics that you're, uh, that you're going after. So let's, let's go to the next slide. Um, now, break 
Vital. Uh, Jeff talked about the subscription economy. I'm talking a lot more about a subset of, of that uh, economy, which is namely that of, of the SaaS uh, application companies. And we find that breakout SaaS companies um, not only uh, understand this, this life cycle, but they uh, and, uh, but also how to if they understand how to effectively leverage the cloud in order to decrease their customer acquisition costs to decrease the customer support costs, to decrease the customer renewal costs, and finally to identify uh, customer problems and in this way improve both renewals and, and upsells. And what I have done in each of these categories, I have, um, I have provided uh, a, a number of ways that the cloud can be utilized in order to um, in order to impact these costs or impact the, the, these insights. And um, I, I have also, uh, you know, one of the, the points that I have, I'm making both to our portfolio companies and also to uh, companies that we meet with and want to invest in it is the importance of capturing and analyzing um, uh, usage data. Uh, some time ago, uh, I, had, I had introduced the concept of insight as a service in order to describe ways under which SaaS applications can be benchmarked and in this way, again, keep improving uh, the, um, uh, the metrics that, uh, that we're talking about. In, in summary here, you need to determine what the cloud buys you and decide if your application can still use a subscription model even if it is delivered um, uh, on uh, premise. Let's go to the next slide. Um, during our efforts to identify the breakout SaaS companies to invest in uh, or how to improve our existing uh, portfolio SaaS companies, we pay attention to, to a few metrics uh, such as the, uh, the growth rate of the annual recurring revenue, uh, the, the churn uh, of the ARR, and the company's profitability characteristics. And, and we try to determine um, which band they, they fall in. So, so this is, um, you know, again, we're, uh, as we see, we try to be a, as analytical as we can, but, but at the end, we can only deal at a, at a rather high level. But here I'm trying to, to, to depict which of the companies, we've, what are the characteristics of the companies that we believe is uh, having breakout potential. So again, uh, with regards to the uh, ARR growth rate, we want that to, to stay on um, at, at, at uh, you know, 80 to 100 plus uh, percent year over year, particularly as the company moves from its early stage to its expansion stage to its growth stage. Um, on, the, uh, on, on the ARR churn, um, we want not only to see low churn, but we're also talking about um, what is now starting to be called negative churn. And, and negative churn means that the ARR from existing customers, mm -hmm. and in fact the ARR that existing customers are contributing from upsells and cross-sells is higher than the ARR lost from churn customers. And, and this is why uh, counting the ARR churn is more important than counting the customer count uh, churn. And, and finally, as we're looking at profitability, um, what, we are, what we have observed is that at the breakout companies, as they go from unprofitable to profitable, um, they have the opportunity to then determine profitability at will. So that means that they can, and I go back to an earlier comment, they can determine when to go for market share and maybe at that point um, uh, uh, become unprofitable and when to, uh, to continue running a profitable operation. And that's why it's important this, for these companies to understand all of these metrics as they do uh, because they, they really then become masters of their, um, of their fate. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, profitability enables a company to focus on the right profit margins um, and, and we want, and so for example, we want to make sure that uh, the SaaS companies that we consider breakout achieve at least 70% gross margins on, 
on license fees and at least 10 to 20 percent on services. So in other words, they do not lose money um, on, on services. Uh, so the next slide, please. Um, uh, so as we bring all this analysis together, we conclude that breakout SaaS companies have five key characteristics. They understand where cash is spent, uh, they make the proper cost and expense adjustments to reduce their burn, and they sign longer-term contracts without upfront payments and without discounting. And the, the discounting issue is something that a lot of times I argue with the CEOs of my portfolio companies and remind them that when companies like Oracle, for example, uh, offer their um, uh, maintenance fees, their maintenance contracts, they don't discount them at all. The second characteristic is that they have productive sales forces that are focusing on customer lifetime value and ARR rather than any other revenue type. Uh, third, they learn how to cost effectively delight their customers and in this way move to negative ARR churn. They uh, create the best combination of cost structure and customer interaction in order to, um, to maximize their ARR and, and that again has implications of how you organize your, your sales team and your services team. And finally, they focus on profitable customers and understand how to make customers profitable most of the times in, uh, in less than a year. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so as, uh, as investors, um, we, um, we care about the cost associated of, of achieving and maintaining a particular, a particular ARR growth rate and the implication to the total uh, capital that will need to be raised. We care about the customer lifetime value. We care about the percent of profitable customers that the company has, the margins that it achieves, and the customer contract terms. And finally, the, we care about the ARR churn and the renewal cost and the speed of which can reach and maintain profitability at the particular uh, revenue uh, level. Next slide, please. So, um, so in, uh, in conclusion, uh, we, we feel that breakout companies command disproportionate uh, investor attention. They're priced for their ARR growth rates, their ARR retention rate, and the growth rate from the upsell and cross-sell. They understand customer lifetime value and other customer characteristics that allow them to achieve profitability at will. Uh, the, their capital efficiency enables them to determine when to go after market share and when to go for profitability. And uh, finally, the, the cloud will really provide significant leverage and improve capital efficiency to break out companies that use subscription models and it should be uh, used as such. Uh, Jeff, back to you. Thanks, Evangelos. And, uh... You know, Vangelos, you know, really kind of hit upon, you know, some of some of the key uh, kind of attributes and metrics that that, that breakout co companies need to, to, to be able to look at. And I uh, just wanted to kind of take it back to, to, to some of the, the earlier slides. I've been monitoring the, uh, uh, the, the chat board and, and the private questions, and, and there's been, been a lot of interest in, 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 in both the content uh, pieces here. And uh, just wanted to sum it from, from a Zora standpoint, and then we're going to open it up for, for about 15 minutes of, of Q&A. Uh, but but our our definition uh, of these three SaaS me metrics, uh, we we think this is uh, it's new, it's it's groundbreaking. Um, this is these are metrics that, that that we haven't shared before. We've been been really kind of talking about these three metrics: uh, uh, retention rate, recurring profit margin, and growth efficiency for for just just the last few months. And um, you know we think that this this provides a, a good foundation uh, to to build your 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 company and and, and become a breakout company. And, uh, and, and obviously, I think that we're going to go through, through iterations of, of, of the, these metrics, or at least um, you know, how you can, uh, can look at, at, at deriving these metrics uh, based on your business, whether you're maybe B2C, B2B, or in a different industry. Um, but but uh, hopefully, this provides a, a really good framework for, 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 for discussion internally, either um, in the boardrooms or at, at an ESAP level. Uh, so, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Dexter, and uh, we're going to open it up to uh, to 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 some some Q and A. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Jeff. We have some uh, great questions coming in. Thank you for all that are participating. Uh, to kick off the question uh, portion of the webinar, a question from Ken Richards: uh, Do you look at renewals on a number of customers or a percent of revenue? 
Yeah, that, that, that's a really good good question. Um, uh, at least for, for, for the model that, that, that we've been, been looking at is, 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 is we, we're looking at based on, on a number of customers. Uh, we think that uh, you could probably build two models and look at both, but, 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 but just assuming that, that, that your business has a, a fairly stable, um, you know, average, you know, ACV, then uh, it, it, it's, 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 I think, a good way to look at it is number of customers. Now, if you have a business where you have, you know, multi, multi-million dollar deals and you have really low-end deals, then you might want, want to look at, at a little bit of a mix. Uh, does, uh, Evangelist, did you have a perspective on that? Yeah, I think uh, earlier on in the companies we, uh, so for earlier and expansion stage companies, we definitely look on a number of customers because we, uh, we want all of, our cust- all of our companies to be going for uh, market share. Uh, later on, as we try to understand um, how the, uh, it, it, as you all know, the, the, most of the SaaS companies are going after a land and expand strategy. So as the, as the company expands, we do want to see renewals in terms of the, the uh, amount of, of revenue because we want to see how the company is expanding uh, within a particular uh, customer. All right, so uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, how do you see the 90% grow, uh, goal, how do you see the 90% goal of renewal rate work across different types of companies, say, say Salesforce versus Buddy Media? Yeah, so I think, I think that, that question is really about, about how, how, how do you model you know, re- renewals? Uh, uh, do, 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 you, do you model it to, to reflect uh, you know, an enterprise company or, 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 or a small to medium-sized business or maybe a company that has a hybrid model? Uh, I think if, if you look at the examples that, that, that I, I gave, um, the success, success factors had a high renewals rate because they focused mostly on enterprise. Um, in the early years, Salesforce.com focused on a lot of small to, to medium-sized businesses and even individuals, so, so their renewal rate was, was actually less. Uh, but I think if you're looking at today like a social media company versus a, an enterprise SaaS company, then you're, you're going to have obviously different type of renewals rates um, based on, on, on those type of companies because naturally, um, if you're selling to, to the SMB, you're probably going to have more attrition. Uh, Evangelist, did you have a perspective on, on that? Yeah, actually, I was going to say, I mean, this, this is a very interesting and provides a kind of nuanced uh, way of, of looking at the, at the issue. Um, a lot of our, of the companies that we invest in tend to target the mid-upper enterprise, so let's say $300 million in sales on up, uh, so they targeting those, those kind of companies. And uh, in, in that case, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the Customer base tends to be a lot more stable than when when we invest in uh, the either SMB or the Troop S of the of the SMB, where where we can we can see higher uh, much higher attrition. And one of the ways that, so that a lot of the metrics, I'm sorry, a lot of the metrics that that, that I described in, in my part of the presentation and and the banding that I've done is reflective of this mid upper enterprise focus that we have. In our uh, in our investment criteria, yeah, and some of the things that, that I see see a lot a lot of our customers doing, and, and a lot of small to medium sized businesses uh, or, or, or companies that sell a software product for small and medium sized businesses is, is they look to to, to have self service automation and, and the ability to 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 automate everything from uh, a customer signing up to a customer utilizing the service to a customer either paying month to month or committing to to a longer term contract. And then even renewing online, um, those are, are, are attributes of, of, of how uh, to, uh, to, to drive a, a higher renewal rate specifically in, in, in the SMB. All right, so uh, another question uh, that just popped up. Uh, I think, Jeff, this would be a great one for you. How do you calculate growth efficiency index? Yeah, so, so the way that we're calculating growth efficiency C index is, is really... Um, let, let, let's say that uh, you have um, $40 uh, that, that you want to spend on, on growth, and uh, uh, that $40 uh, yields $40 of new uh, ARR for the year. Uh, that gives you a, a one-to-one ratio. Now, if that, uh, if, if that 
gave you only twenty dollars, then your ratio would be less. If it gave you sixty dollars, your 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 ratio would be uh, actually be the the reverse. Um, so uh, th that, that's how we're we're calculating growth efficiency. Is it, really uh, the the dollar that you spend on growth yields uh, the dollar of, of net ARR. Yeah, a lot of uh, there's another question that that came through here. Um, uh, I, I saw a, a good debate on uh, on, on sales and marketing costs, and uh, do, do you account for that as, as a one-time cost? Uh, you know, for purposes of the model, I think I think I mentioned that that as we went through some of those slides, uh, we're trying to simplify this model, and um, we we put sales and marketing as as one-time costs uh, because they they are costs associated to grow the base, um, uh, but but obviously they could be 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 actually lumped in as as recurring expenses as well. Because these are recurring expenses that, that as the business you're, you're looking to, to incur on, on an ongoing basis. And another question relating to, uh, to, to where to put um, um, a dollars uh, spent to service the base was, what do you put in account management people? Um, uh, did you put those in COGS? And, and I would say yes, uh, that, that, that you could put them in COGS because uh, the people that you have to, to manage your customers, whether they're customer success or account managers, um, um, are are, are Cost to service uh, your uh, customers and service your your, your application. I, I agree with that. By the way, that that's that's has been our advice to our portfolio as well. All right. Another question just popped up. Uh, what is the incentive to sign up a customer for a long long term contract with no discount? Yeah, Evangel Evangelist, did you want to talk about that? I think that that comment came up as you you, you were you were presenting. Um, so um, we are, um, again, um, uh, what we would like to be able to, uh, people understand what is the, the importance of having long-term, uh, longer-term contracts. Uh, we, we want, we like the stability and the predictability, obviously, of the, um, of, of the subscription uh, model. We want to be able to, so what we are advocating our companies to do is to sign longer term contracts and to have a portion of the contract paid up front. That's why I made the, the point uh, about, um, uh, uh, about terms. Now, um, what, what, cust what we have found customers of our portfolio companies and also uh, other uh, companies that we talk to is that uh, in, order for, in order to sign uh, a longer term contract, they want anywhere from uh, three to five, or maybe two to five percent per year of contract in discount. And uh, what we are advocating there to do is to, to demonstrate to uh, customers and prospects what is the ROI of signing up uh, a, a contract with a company as opposed to going and, and taking an on-premise uh, an on-premise solution. Uh, and from this ROI calculation, we typically, uh, or our portfolio companies are typically able to convince uh, customers that even without any discounting, and of course all com cost customers expect some discounting, the value that they're getting from the, from the use of the, of the SaaS software is far superior to the value that they will be getting from an on-premise, uh, an equivalent on-premise software uh, with the, the typical uh, upfront cost that uh, such software entails. So that's why we are advocating no discounting. All right. So uh, Evangelist, this is a great question that just popped up on the, on the, the Q&A feed. Um, are you more hesitant to invest in companies who serve uh, SMBs in light of the economic downturns where these businesses are more strapped for cash? Uh, yeah, and actually I will say I, I, ha I have written about this in my blog. We have, unfortunately, um, we have seen um, uh, the, the SMB not recovering as fast uh, as the rest of the economy. Uh, is recovering. So uh, because of that, uh, we see hesitation by such customers to, um, to accept uh, 
uh, longer term contracts uh, with uh, with application companies uh, they tend to have much higher attrition you know uh, going to north of 15 percent uh, annually and when you're so unless you have a, a very efficient customer acquisition um, uh, model and that's why again I go back to why I described the entire uh, customer life cycle um, uh, Unless you have a very uh, efficient customer acquisition model, uh, it, it is very challenging to uh, to, to uh, make money in in those uh, in those areas. Now, as I said, it's not that there are no companies that are not being successful there, but by and large, because of these conditions, uh, particularly over the last few years, we have uh, paid a lot more attention to SaaS companies that focus on the mid upper enterprise. All right, fantastic. Uh, to the audience, thank you for all these questions. These are phenomenal questions. We have a ton coming through. Next one is, uh, if churn is not a problem and you have confidence in your product, why long term? A shorter term contract demonstrates confidence in the product to the customer, which increases sales. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll take that answer. I think that there's two ways to look at this. Uh, long term perspective, right? You could potentially bring it in cash um, in the door, which, which you can use the cash for, 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 for a variety of reasons. Um, but, but I think this, this question has, has a really, really good, good point. If, if you do have a, a great product out there and, and a product that, that is going to catch on really, really quickly, um, and, and, and you can drive, you know, exponential net new customers, um, by getting them in the door with shorter term contracts, um, we've seen lots and lots of companies do that. I think box.net is, is a great example of a, of a company that, you know, has a product that has been relatively easy to get in the door. You know, for those of you in Silicon Valley and driving down 101, I think their slogan was, you know, 72 or 77 percent of enterprises use Box.com or Box now. And um, you know, most of, of how they got into to those enterprise businesses were were working in, in individual departments, and then um, you know, having people pay for these things on, on a monthly basis, and then they would go in and, and sell a longer term enterprise license. So. If that's a strategy that you can deploy based on you have a really you know solid product that that's easy to use, easy to deploy, easy to to, to get adoption, then I think that is a, a perfectly fine strategy. Um, yeah, and I will add to that um, again. The we we want we we have seen these breakout companies always becoming um, uh, masters of their own fate uh, if they're able to, if they're able to. to pulling cash and, and use it without necessarily having to always go out and, and raise new capital in order say, to continue growing the company. Longer term contracts with upfront payment, you know, not just a longer term contract, but longer term contracts with upfront payment uh, have that uh, capability. They also allow you to, to lock in the, uh, the customer um, and um, uh, and, and then keep expanding uh, on that. Not for everybody, but uh, again, it's it's an important tool in the uh, arsenal of, of SaaS companies. All right, fantastic. Evangelist, we have a question uh, for you. Uh, you see a lot of companies. Uh, what, is, what, what is the number one tip uh, you would give to uh, your portfolio companies? What is the number one? I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you said. The number one. Uh, yeah, what, what's the number one? What's the number one? Uh, what, what's your words of wisdom? If, if you you had a uh, portfolio company and, and they were thinking about about growing their business, what's what's the one thing that that, that you would tell them to focus on? Uh, I'm I'm asking them uh, to to focus, as I said, on, on both um, ARR growth rate, but uh, but also on ARR churn and, and profitability. So th these three the, the three. Um, Characteristic that I, I showed and I showed the banding that th those are very much how I I drive my uh, my portfolio companies. Great, and then uh, you know in the interest of time here, we're we're coming up to uh, to the top of the hour. We usually like to, to get these webinars done in uh, in, in forty five minutes or, or less, just to, to let people go back to uh, to their desks and uh, get back to the day. Um, we have a ton of questions here here that we've got from the audience. This has been, been a really good discussion. And uh, I wish we could, we could answer all these questions. And what, what Dexter and myself and Evangelist are going to do is we're going to take all these questions and we're going to see if we can bubble them up 
and, and, and see if there's a way for us to, uh, to actually air, air these questions somewhere, um, just like we're going to air the slides so that we can at least respond to, to as many as, as we can. Uh, and, uh, and maybe I'll just, just end with, with one last question for, for Evangelos, who's been, been, been a great guest here on this webinar, is uh, uh, you, you see also uh, a lot of, uh, of companies that, that are looking for, for venture capital money. Um, what, what tips do, do you give to, uh, to, to these entrepreneurs to, uh, who are, are, are looking for, uh, uh, for, for VC money? Well, so uh, our times actually are great for entrepreneurs now. I think the, the balance of power, particularly over the last couple of years, um, has, um, has shifted uh, towards entrepreneurs uh, and management teams. Um, I ask entrepreneurs to, to really think of their, their business model. Um, in, in the past, a few years ago, um, just having a SaaS company uh, could get you in the door. Um, because the, but now we have thousands, literally thousands of SaaS, of SaaS companies, some small, some, some large. Um, so just saying that I have a, a, a SaaS, uh, you know, SaaS application doesn't doesn't quite um, uh, do it uh, for for us. You really need to have uh, kind of a, a, an innovative application, but more importantly, an innovative business model that will allow you to to get to uh, uh, to, to winning metrics here uh, and, and create uh, a breakout success. Um, the problem that we have as investors is that in every subspace that we look at, uh, there are 10 to 15 competitors, and uh, we we make um, you know five to 10 investments per year. Uh, we see about a thousand plans per year. Uh, maybe some years a little even even more than that. So um, we. we we are looking for, for the special teams that are able to articulate not only the fact that, hey, I have a, a SaaS application, I'm cloud-based and whatever, but they, they really thought about how their business model will allow them to create uh, that type of breakout success. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, be on Zora's webinar. Evangelos, thank you so much for taking the time to be on our webinar. And Jeff, uh, thank you as well. Everyone have a fantastic day, and we'll follow up with your questions after the call. Thank you. Great. Very nice. Very nice. So what was the... 115 was tops. You guys sure about the Zora people, so yeah. assume that's about 100? Yeah.